jokes about how great public and community media is, although they are. And it's not to debate why they should have their funding saved right now in this moment, though they should. In this crowd, that would be preaching to the choir. Our task today is to look ahead. Just last week, a CNN poll found that people radically overestimate the budget, the U.S. budget for our public broadcasting. They estimated, uh, the median estimate was that 5% of the entire U.S. budget is spent on public broadcasting. <laughs> that would give you about $178 billion a year. I'll take it. All right, perfect. The actual number is closer to 100th of 1% of the U.S. budget, which goes to public broadcasting. We are one of the lowest countries in the world in our support for public broadcasting. It's less than $1.50 per person per year. That's pocket change. And this is what we're fighting about cutting right now. But here's the kicker. In that CNN poll, even with that wild overestimation of the budget for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a majority of people still supported maintaining that funding or increasing it. People are hungry for what public and community media provides. People are ready for more public and community media. And people are willing to pay for it, even though the, the you know, discussions in the news right now and on Capitol Hill might, might make you think otherwise. Time and time again, people have shown that they are ready for more public media. As I said, today our task is to look ahead. The decisions we make today in our communities, at our state houses, and in our Congress will have huge implications for the state of American media and our public media abroad. So I've asked this incredible panel to look ahead beyond what public and community media are doing today and give us a vision of public broadcasting's future. What are the innovative ideas, the path-breaking programming, the bold collaborations that are reshaping public media and that you all are, are embarking on? How do you hope to serve your communities better? How will you bring even more public into public broadcasting? Each of the panelists will pitch to us their vision, and then we'll jump into a strategic and practical discussion of what it will take to achieve those visions. There will be no cards floating around, as I mentioned, so please do add your questions to the conversation. We'll discuss what each of us can do individually and together in our communities and in our capital to secure a stronger, better public media. So to start us off, I'm very excited to introduce President Lee Bollinger of Columbia University. In recent years, he has emerged, Columbia has emerged as a leader in the debate over public policy's role in journalism. And President Bollinger himself has been an outspoken advocate for expanding and evolving public broadcasting and community media in America. President Bollinger is one of our country's preeminent experts on the First Amendment, and his recent book, Uninhibited, Robust, and Wide Open, A Free Press for a New Century, he explores the meaning of freedom of press in our globalized internet age. President Bollinger? Thank you very much, uh, Josh, and thank you to um, all of you for coming uh, to this extraordinary thing. I have not seen um, uh, this kind of energy at a conference on these issues in uh, a long, long time, so it's, it's wonderful to see. What I can, I think, add uh, to this discussion uh, is the viewpoint of a First Amendment scholar uh, and somebody who uh, grew up in a family that uh, owned a small town newspaper. Uh, so I have that uh, personal experience in what might be called community journalism. But more importantly, I think uh, it's the First Amendment background and the public policy back background uh, that I have. So I'm going to uh, try to, uh, uh, in five or ten minutes, give you a sense of what I think is a new dimension uh, to the discussion about American journalism and uh, public funded journalism in particular. First, um, it's important to have a sense of the First Amendment. First Amendment as we know it today in our country, the United States, has the strongest protections for freedom of the press and freedom of speech of any nation in the world. And I think most everybody in the country takes great pride in that fact. In fact, it's an extraordinary thing that 
the entire political spectrum from left to right, as reflected perhaps on the United States Supreme Court, now embraces an incredibly strong, really unique system of protections, constitutional protections for freedom of speech and press uh, in this country. How did that happen? It's really a story of the last century. It's not something that goes back to the founding. The First Amendment is part of the founding documents. But the modern First Amendment as we know it really begins in 1919. That's the first time that the Supreme Court ever interpreted the First Amendment. And it was not an auspicious beginning. In fact, one of the key cases that came before the Supreme Court in 1919 involved a presidential candidate uh, Eugene Debs, who was the leader of the Socialist Party in the United States. And Debs gave a speech in Ohio, and all he did in that speech was praise people who had resisted the draft. And for that speech, he was arrested, prosecuted, along with thousands of other people in the United States, and sentenced to jail. He went up to the Supreme Court, and in a famous decision, the first decision of the Supreme Court, as I said, by Oliver Wendell Holmes, one of the great justices uh, in our history, the Supreme Court upheld the conviction. Eugene Debs went to jail, and during the 1920 presidential election, he received over a million votes while in jail. <laughs> Now, that's uh, not an auspicious beginning, completely uh, inconsistent with where we stand today. The Supreme Court, from that point, in fact, within a year, Oliver Wendell Holmes had changed his view about freedom of speech and press, became an incredible advocate, a beautiful advocate for this. And with fits and starts, the 1950s were not a great time for us uh, on free speech, free press. But by the 1960s, we began to have a series of, of decisions that really cemented freedom of the press as we know it today. And one of the key decisions of that period was New York Times versus Sullivan. What happened in this period was that the United States went from a society in which each individual state had more or less its own rules about freedom of speech and press, and some were quite open and some were very restrictive. And that became intolerable. And it became intolerable because we moved from a federalist, local, state society to a national one with a national economy, a national set of issues, civil rights, environment, other issues, and you had to have a free press system principles for a system that was national. You had to create a national public forum. And through Sullivan and Pentagon Papers and Brandenburg and a number of other decisions through the 60s and 70s, the Supreme Court did that. Today, I think we're now at a new point. It happens to be in the new century, uh, but it's a point where we have to go from creating a national public forum to a global public forum. Because the United States and the rest of the world are entering into a world economy aided by extraordinary new communications technologies, the internet in particular, but also satellite broadcasting. And these new technologies and these world uh, events, the world economy, are creating a world system, whether we like it or not. The data are overwhelming. One half of all the revenues of the S&P 500 companies now come from outside the United States. One half of the debt of the United States is owned by foreign entities. One half of all the manufactured goods we consume in the United States are produced outside the United States. We now are interdependent with the world. For the first time in our history, we no longer control, through our own choices, the energy costs that are needed for our society. We are now part of a world system, interdependent with it, integrated with it, and that means we have to have a system of communication, a system of discussion, a global public forum in which to analyze, critique, understand, 
channel, change, resist all of what's happening. And just as New York Times versus Sullivan said, we cannot live any longer with Alabama having its own rules about libel law. We have to have a national standard, and it's got to be strong, because the issues are too important to allow local censorship to dominate. Now we have to confront these issues on a global scale. And that's not going to be easy, but it's imperative, because the issues are global. The issues of the global economy, the issues of the global environment, the issues of multiculturalism around the world, the issues of democracy and authoritarianism, and on and on are global issues. When you look at it that way, you have three things you have to focus on. One is censorship. It is now the case that you say something here in the United States, you may have the strongest protections in the world, but you may end up being sued for libel in a British court. You may be subject to criminal prosecution in Italy or Turkey or elsewhere. It is no longer, in that sense, a national public forum. So we're going to have to deal with global censorship issues. The second thing we're going to have to deal with is access to places around the world, and including to our own country. We require foreign journalists to get a special visa to be able to come into the United States and to function as journalists in the United States. We engage periodically in major propaganda campaigns in countries throughout the world. That is no longer something that is independent of what happens here, because that propaganda campaign comes back into our own public discussion. So censorship, access, and the last is capacity. We need a higher capacity to deal with the issues we're facing on a global scale. I'm just going to focus on the last, that is capacity, and that takes me to public funding of media. One of the extraordinary events of the past decade, really the past half decade, is the decline in funding a financial model for the institutional press. I am all in favor of citizen journalism. But along with citizen journalism, you need, you should want, an institutionalized press that is big and powerful and capable of taking on the issues of the time because you cannot expect lone individuals or groups to be able to cover all that's needed. You need large institutions. And in order to have that, you have to face the fact that our business model of a free market, to the extent that it exists now, is not going to support that level of institutional journalism. And it is a fact that foreign bureaus have been closed, as you all know, with a rapidity that no one would have guessed a decade ago. The Miami Herald used to have 14 bureaus in South America. It now has none. I sit on the board of the Washington Post Company. There's been a necessary contraction because of financial considerations. That is tragic. At the very moment we need more coverage of international issues. At the very moment, the world needs more free press journalism speaking to it about the global issues. We have less. Quite apart from that, there is simply a need for more. And the only place we're going to get that, in my view, is through significant increases in public funding of NPR and PBS in particular, or some form of journalism publicly funded that takes on the world. Now, the last part of the argument is, as soon as you say this, it is amazing how strong a reaction there is in the country to public funding of journalism. And I'm quite dazzled by that opposition because it seems to me so ill-considered and so short-sighted and actually so wrong in so many respects. I think we need a balance. We obviously need press 
that it does not have public funding. And we need press that may be a blend of some kinds of public funding, but other funding. But it makes no sense at all to say we cannot embark on a system of public funding a broadcast. For, let me just say, I realize that everything I'm saying at this moment is politically incredibly unrealistic. Uh, there is no chance that anything that I'm saying will be persuasive in this environment. Uh, because we're fighting just to, to keep what is there, which is way too small to, to do what I'm talking about. But the arguments, and I'll make them very quickly here to conclude, for why public funding of journalism is a reasonable thing to do, start with the fact that we have never had a free market for journalism as we know it today. Newspapers, independent or uh, uh, private newspapers, have been able to do the reporting they've done as sophisticated as international and so on only because they have been natural monopolies. Every single city had one dominant, usually exclusive daily newspaper. And they had monopoly profits, and typically they use those to enhance their coverage. Broadcasting was a blend of private ownership, public policy regulation. And of course, we've had NPR and PBS for quite some time, several decades. Not only that, but we have a global system, an international system of publicly funded journalism called Voice of America and Radio Free Europe. That, in my view, has done its service but it is now an anachronism. It makes no sense to have a government-funded propaganda arm of the American government serving as the global professional journalism that we need. I think there's much in Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, and other parts of the system that do good journalism, but it will always be perceived as government uh, propaganda. So that system needs to be changed and the free press that we have a professional journalism already established, NPR and PBS, needs to be enhanced considerably and to be given the larger mission of developing a global press. Uh, the free press that uh, has professional journalism independent and so on. And the last thing is this. We have a long tradition in this country of publicly funding things that we know the market will not provide. I am the president of Columbia University. Columbia U University receives hundreds of millions of dollars every year in public funding for science, for scholarships for students, and for other things we do, especially the biological sciences. We care at Columbia and universities like Columbia across the country, we care as much about our academic freedom as journalists care about their journalistic freedom. And we have worked out a system over the past several decades in which there have been very few violations of that academic freedom because of the government funding. It is possible to do we can build a First Amendment principle that helps to secure that editorial autonomy or academic freedom. We can, in fact, build on the independent journalism we already have to create something that will be world class and serve the world and serve the United States. Other countries are doing this. BBC, of course, BBC World, BBC World Service have been doing it for decades with great distinction and continue to do so today. But you have France creating France 24. You have China launching CCTV to really reach the world. You have Al Jazeera, which has, of course, its several forms, and it is developing a global media presence. You have Russia today and on and on. Other countries have realized we're in a global public forum for this interconnected, integrated society. It would be tragic for the United States to sit by and assume that the world and our citizens can be well served 
sufficiently served by the system we have. That's the primary argument, I think, for massive, very significant increase in funding for public broadcasting. Thank you. I have to say it's very refreshing to hear somebody else uh, talking that way about the potential of public broadcasting and the, the need for such massive expansion of public broadcasting. Uh, many of you may know of Free Press, we've published a number of reports not only outlining what we see as the need to expand public broadcasting, but also some strategies for how we might get there, and you can find those at Save the News. Next we'll hear from Paula Kerger, the President and C CEO of PBS. Paula has helped forge new ground at PBS, working with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and NPR to launch local journalism centers around the country, helping to reinvent PBS's news, news Hour as a hybrid TV web series that's producing content on both platforms independently and uh, in collaboration. And she's been investing in innovative arts, history, and educational programming that's available across a range of platforms from TV, to tablets, to Twitter. She's brought a clip that shows how public broadcasting is going beyond informing to fully engaging our communities across the US. And I'll pull that up right now. And then we'll hear from Paula. What made you want to take part in this? I want to help break down this uh, barrier of segregation. We want one to celebrate the integration of the way there's one many. I want to help establish the right of all Americans to be and to travel together. The more they try to force us into doing something, then the worse the reaction will be.
out there. Paul, I look forward to hearing what's next for PBS. Thank you for inviting me to, uh, to be with you today. I am very proud that we are working with our partners at WGBH on this project. Um, this is uh, an important story that needs to be told, and this and the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides is a significant time, and in, I think in so many ways such an important time for the story to be um, out there. Um, as um, Stanley Nelson has woven together testimony, uh, first person testimony from um, an amazing group of, of people uh, that came together. It's an important broadcast event and I'm proud that it's part of what we do on public broadcasting. But beyond just showcasing an extraordinary documentary film, we have the opportunity to take it to the next level and to bring this project to life and to engage our stations across the country. This, after all, is what makes us so unique in public broadcasting, is that uh, we are, in fact, a, um, a group of independent stations across the country who are lo locally owned and operated. Most parts of the country, we are the only remaining locally owned and operated broadcasters. And so to be able to take a powerful documentary such as this and not just put it out there, but to engage communities at the community by community level, I think is what um, is unique for us and that we feel is very much a part and that really at the heart of all that we do. I'm, I was embarrassed to show that tape since I'm in it. Actually, David said, don't feel bad. The tape I'm showing, I'm in it too. So, <laughs> but um, but the, the thing is, uh, we got over 1,000 applications for those 40 seats. And the uh, 40 uh, young men and women who will be traveling on the bus next month uh, have just been notified. And many of them were selected because of their use of social media and because of their interest in engaging conversations at the community level. And so they're going to be sharing, as you know, of course, the Freedom Rise was also very much uh, a story, um, not just of the courage of the people that were on that bus, but how the media played a part in really changing the way America thought about itself. It was so much a part of that story to be able to have kids on that trip twittering and, and filing reports and creating a larger dialogue, I think it's going to give this film even that much more resonance. Um, there's also, as part of the Freedom Ride uh, project, a large traveling exhibit uh, that is sort of a mini museum of sorts that's going to be traveling across the country and will visit 20 cities over the course of 2011. Um, as part of the project, we've developed curriculum for the classroom. Um, that will be a combination of using some of the, of the uh, first person accounts through video form, but also um, inviting some of the um, freedom riders to participate in community discussions around the country. Uh, we also um, have been doing a significant amount of work in public television in bringing video into the classroom in a form that teachers can use in smaller video segments. Uh, we've just announced a partnership with WGBH and several of our stations to create a large video repository of content across many subjects uh, that can be streamed in the classrooms free of charge uh, that teachers can use uh, for their curriculum. And this project is one um, for which we have built a curriculum for, at both the middle school and, and high school level. Um, we're committed uh, within public broadcasting to encourage civic engagement and to help people look beyond the day-to-day -day and to look at uh, both opportunities and challenges that surround us. And as we consider our work, we are very much focused, of course, in our work as a broadcaster, uh, but increasingly in the possibilities of tackling projects in both a multi-platform and multi-dimensional uh, approach. Um, and the impact that we have is significant. Um, as we have been uh, meeting with a number of people on the Hill the last few months, uh, we've, we've looked for opportunities to talk about the impact of our work. Um, 10 million more people visited the national parks in 2009 
after Ken Burns' documentary series, The National Parks America's Best Idea, premiered 10 million Americans, many of whom had never really thought about the national parks as a place for them and their families. And when the uh, Park Service announced the significant increase in park attendance, they credited Ken. Um, I think there are ways that we can um, open up new horizons, I mean, literally, for Americans, and I think that's just one example. We're very committed to the work that we do in the classroom, and we are particularly focused on work for our youngest Americans. I know that many people in this room share our concern about access for young children to quality preschool education. Not every home has a computer. Not every child has access to high quality preschool, but most homes do have television sets. And the work that we do uh, for children is tremendously important. Um, we are focused on um, a schedule of broadcast programs that are not just safe and nice for children to watch, but that are curriculum based. Over the course of the last six years, we've brought in more than a dozen new programs into our schedule in an attempt to really bump up the academic uh, basis of the work that we're doing. And we are focused on basic literacy as well as the STEM subjects as a way to really engage children beginning at the youngest age. And we have a lot of uh, substantive research now behind the work that we're doing that demonstrates that building on the legacy that Sesame Street began 40 years ago, but continuing with the work that we're doing now, both in broadcast as well as on air and in, on uh, devices such as the iPad and, uh, and smartphones, that we engage children's minds and we, in fact, are moving the needle in education. Um, at a time when funding for music and the arts, uh, particularly in the schools, is being cut, uh, we are doubling down our efforts to expand the work that we're doing in bringing um, art, both visual art as well as performance art, to Americans across the country, no matter what your economic means or, or where you live. We feel that every American has a right to have a front row seat to the best art that this country produces. And so over the course of this next year, we're looking to significantly increase the amount of arts programming that we have on public television. And um, for those that have said, particularly in this latest debate on the Hill, that they understood the importance of public broadcasting back when we were founded, but aren't quite sure the relevance of our uh, industry now, given the expanded opportunities on um, television and cable and other um, uh, platforms. I have to tell you that um, over this year so far, our primetime audience has increased 8%. We have 132,000 more Americans watching PBS at any given moment. Our children's uh, broadcasts uh, audience has increased 15%. Um, we are um, um, seeing tremendous increase in the amount of people that are accessing our content on um, online and iPhone and iPad. Our preschool video player, which we launched a little more than a year ago, averages 88 million video streams a month, which makes it the most used video service for children. Uh, and we compete against um, uh, corporate organizations that have very deep pockets. So I think clearly um, what we're doing um, has resonance. Um, I have a, 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 it's not a gimmick because it's, it's, um, it's just the fact. When I've traveled around and I've met with people that try to argue that perhaps we would be better off if we were allowed to be commercial, um, I point out that there actually is an uh, example of what commercialization of public broadcasting could look like. And that's the many cable channels that started out with this grand and noble idea of being the commercial version of public television. I remind people that arts and entertainment, which is now A&E, does not bear a lot of resemblance to the kind of arts programming that I think was the aspiration when it was created. Even the History Channel now has taken an interesting turn um, because that was one of the things we were he hearing on the Hill is, well, you know, I've got the History Channel. Well, if you're interested in pawn stars, then I think you're well served. But if you're interested in a series or, or a project like Stanley Nelson's, then I think you need to come to PBS. 
And so um, my, my little gimmick is a lot of times I'll go into offices with a copy of um, the USA Today that I pulled out of my hotel room, and you just rip out the um, TV guide. I don't even have to look at it in advance. And then you just look at what these so-called um, uh, commercial versions of public broadcasting have on their air. And I'm not denigrating commercial media. I, I watch a lot of television, and there's a lot of creative work. Uh, well, there's some creative work. Um, <laughs> it's not quite the same as what we did. No, it's interesting. Um, it's 50 years ago this month, actually, I think it was at NAB, that Newton Minow made his famous Fast Wasteland speech. And um, I've I recently reread it, and I was struck by how much he talked about then that still holds true today. And you know, if you, if you um, talk to Newt about that speech, he'll tell you that he continues to be surprised about the fact that it was the best wasteland part of the speech that people focused on, because what he thought was really the resonant theme in that speech was the whole concept of public interest and the responsibility that that, play, that was placed on broadcasters uh, to educate and engage the American public. And I think in this day when, uh, with so much focus on the bottom line, we need to all remind ourselves that the airwaves are the people's airwaves and that um, they were intended to help prepare a generation for great decisions and to help this nation fulfill its future. Now, when he was asked recently to reflect on the vast wasteland speech, um, he said, a lot of people take issue with me on the ground that the marketplace will provide everything. And this builds, actually, Lee, on, on your comment. He went on to say, I say if that's true, why do we have public libraries? Why do we have public parks? Why do we have public hospitals? We do these things because the marketplace does not provide everything. And so at PBS, we're a public institution that's dedicated to constantly looking at those areas that are not fulfilled by commercial broadcasters. I always like to say our bottom line is the number of lives we touch, not the number of shareholders we enrich. So every day, we hope to make even a little more progress in putting the people's airwaves and increasingly broadcast spectrum, computers, and mobile devices to the service of the American people to indeed help prepare a generation for great decisions and to help a great nation fulfill its future. Thank you for inviting me today. Thank you, Paula. I'm really glad that Paula mentioned the Ken Burns documentary. I don't know how many of you remember what the subtitle of that documentary was, but it was America's Best Idea. And his argument in that documentary is that the national parks, the idea of taking the most beautiful places in America and setting them aside for all people was revolutionary. In every other country, the most beautiful places were set aside for the kings and queens, the elites. In America, we decided to set aside the most important places in our natural world for the people, for all people. And I said to Dayton Duncan, the, 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 one of Ken Burns' co-writers, who's a friend of mine, Dayton, don't you understand? That's the perfect metaphor for public media as well. And so I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, Dayton Duncan actually has, has always pushed back on me um, when, I, when I've challenged him about the, the deficits of television. And he's always said that television can be a transformational medium. And I think one of the people uh, who's also made that case and made it so well through television is David Fanning, who's here with us today. David's been the executive producer for Frontline since its first season back in 1983. Frontline has been a pioneer in documentary journalism, working with hundreds of diverse producers and journalists to tell stories no one else would tell and to tell them in a way only public television can. So I have another clip from David here I'd like to show before he gives his remarks.
very beginning, the idea was really to try to grab hold of the best of narrative documentary, of finding that connection between journalism and filmmaking. It always set its sights as being a series about ideas, but then at the heart of those ideas, there would have to be stories. In coming to some of the victories in the plan, here we are. Josh to not run that because it seems like we didn't need to do more, more chest thumping. But it does seem to me that what's important about that is that's the best argument I can make for public funding. Um, because 80%, 75%, 80% of the budget of Frontline has come from the public television stations. And uh, we've never been able to get the kind of corporate sponsorship or the kind of large and 
significant philanthropic uh, uh, support to do this kind of work. And so that's the record. And that's, and that's uh, you know, I'm not a media theorist. I'm not a political strategist. I'm a kind of practical editor who makes things. And, uh, and if we want to make things and make them well, we need the resources to do it. And uh, there would be no front line without public broadcasting. And um, so I feel very passionate about it. I've spent my life in the medium, in public media, uh, for, as a young filmmaker in, a, in, a, in a, uh, a public television station in Huntington Beach in 1973 when I got my first job as a cinematographer editor. And uh, from WGBH, which gave me enormous and extraordinary support journalistic support, defending work, when it came down to having uh, to, to broadcast uh, a program that had led to a significant break with the Saudi Arabian government, a film called Death of a Princess that I produced, uh, I remember there was huge pressure from the government and from the Secretary of State and, uh, to not run the film on PBS and, uh, and uh, uh, Mobile Oil, uh, supporter of Masterpiece Theatre had taken four page ads out and at WGBH, the home of Masterpiece Theatre, I walked into the, uh, my boss's office, Peter McGee and, and Henry Beckton and said, uh, uh, they said, uh, we're okay for this program and I said, yeah, the journalism's good and they said, okay, well, we think PBS is going to be fine but just in case we've rented space on the transponder on the satellite and we'll put it up out of Boston. So that's the argument for public broadcasting. It was, as Peter later said, when it did broadcast and the world didn't collapse, uh, it actually became, in fact, the instigating moment for Frontline. The idea, as Peter said, it put a chalk behind the wheel of public te television and said, we can withstand pressure from outside. And I think we have to reach deep back into the kind of, into that history. Uh, this place that I worked for all these years, a place that I uh, valued the culture of ideas over anything else, is what we have to re we have to find again in the heart of public broadcasting. So, I, I had a speech. I had a bunch of stuff to say. I'm not sure if I'm going to say any, but I have I have this uh, because I came out of an editing room in New York last night, having pulled apart the program from two weeks away and deciding to do something else, and and I came off the shuttle and I was sitting at home alone at home with my Chinese food and the glamorous life of an executive producer. And, uh, and I got my fortune cookie last night. I guarantee you this is, I have no second source, but this is true. It says, allow disruptions to deepen your concentration. <laughs> so I'm going to wear this one. These are the disruptions. We, are, we have never faced a more historic moment when we are being disrupted in public media and in journalism. And yet I am enormously optimistic about, about the kind of energies that are being uh, released right now in the form of, the, of the, um, the creation, first of all, of the new tools, the access to those tools. I mean, a long way from that 400-foot roll of film that I preciously held on to at KOC in 1973. But the tools you now have access to, this, and where is it? This on the kitchen table. This is a game changer for us. This is a huge change. All of this that's happening in the moment when I was beginning to feel that a lot of what we were, we were doing, the serious, considered, hard work of investigating uh, stories, was going to be fragmented somehow in the kind of quick reflex click of the mouse in the, you know, on the website. It's going to be changed by this. This, the fact that you will be able to to take films long, that, that this is something you want to read and watch and consume and put in your lap and have on the kitchen table and pick up again and, and pick up where you left off is going to change the nature of our engagement. The fact that young children reach now for the telephone for the screen and try to do this to it is going to change all of our habits. So I believe that that's, that's a huge profound game changer for us. I think it's tremendously exciting for us. At the same time, there's an enormous generation of, of people who are fluent in these new media. And, and my job, as part of the old legacy media, and a part of somebody who's been making these, 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 these beautifully wrought cabinets you know, in a workshop for a long time, I now have to take them apart and bring in a lot of new young energy and pull it apart and sort of see if we can make it 
through outsourcing and through collaboration and through partnerships. I mean, when I sit down now with the partnerships that we have with ProPublica, the Center for Investigative Reporting, the Center for Public Integrity, the, uh, the Investigative Reporting Workshop at AU, the in Center for Investigative Reporting, and the in Investigative Reporting Project at Berkeley, I have producers in all of those places working with them right now, and those relationships are spawning the kinds of projects like we just came back from New York on Thursday. We got a Polk Award for something called Law and Disorder that was uh, uh, that really laid the case for for the, uh, the the killing of civilians by police in the wake of Katrina in New Orleans, and that started because of a great reporter at ProPublica. We put a producer sitting with him in his newsroom. They f they walked up, went back to New Orleans together, and shot as they reported. We didn't know where it was going to go. We began to post it on the web. We opened up five storylines on the web, ourselves, ProPublica, and the Times-Picayune together. And over the course of nine months, we not only documented those five cases, but we created a film that led to the conviction two weeks ago of the man who shot Henry Glover to 25 years and, and 17 years for the man who burnt him and his body in a car. That's the real practical result of, of hard journalistic work. <laughs> But it really is because those are the collaborations we have to do now. And they are all important because we're also looking for new relationships. Those same stories were, were done in NPR. Those same stories, we've been doing work with uh, the world at PRI. We're working with Marketplace. We're constantly looking for these new relationships. The news hour is, is putting out frontline scoops when we can't, we don't have the airtime to put them on, and then we're coming to them later. That's changed the ecology of our work. But behind all of this lies this big looming question of who's going to keep paying for it? And who's going to keep paying for it, I believe, not only is the argument that we have to make much more strongly on the hill and, and out there in the communities about the value that has got back from the investment, but I think also there has to be a very concerted effort to test ourselves for where we're spending the money and are we getting a return on it? And are we getting a return on one, the, the value that above all else, other beyond the, va the, the values of fairness and trust uh, and, ex and excellence is in fact that last quality, excellence. We have to reward the very good work in the system and we have to re reward the very good work that is done in collaboration and in partnership and it's, uh, it's really the stations, the local stations and others who are out there making the active collaborations with other, with other journalistic entities who, um, who should be rewarded for that work. Because ultimately I think, I believe, and this is of course my bias, I believe that, is that, that journalism, the idea that Lee Bollinger talks about, the idea of a free press, the idea of a, of a muscular free press, is the argument we need to make for public broadcasting. We make a lot of other cultural arguments that I think are, are important as well and for children's programming, but ultimately I think we have to have the spine to argue for journalism Why and to argue for it. I think that's exactly the test and I think that the test is going to have to be because I do believe that the relationship that I need to have to the dollars that come back to me has to be to the individuals who are prepared to give money to an institution like Frontline through their public television stations, but it's incumbent, I think, increasingly on public television stations that have grown very distant from their, from their, from their earlier missions, I think, and have turned much more into, into self-absorbed fundraising machines in many cases, but in fact need to be able to actively open themselves up to other members of the community and to become the nexus of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of, a, of, a, of the new world of journalism. If we don't do that, then we're really going to be completely irrelevant. And as broadcasters, not only they, are they becoming irrelevant, but uh, they would have to reinvent themselves because broadcasts are not going to go away. And those broadcast stations need to stay there and need to be um, uh, I need to, I'm going to running out of time here, right? So let me just shut up for a moment and answer some more uh, in, in the questions. But ultimately, I think it is the test of ourselves that if we don't pursue excellence, if we don't demand excellence of the, of the parts of the system, then I think uh, we're, uh, we don't deserve the money. Thank you.
actually that question, um, as well as some of the discussion of, of how we define public media is a good segue to our next discussion, person discussing with us. Sure. The, the question was about uh, commu independent community producers uh, having access to public broadcasting stations and resources. Um, and so one of the things that we've talked about here, and Lee Bollinger mentioned this, is how we define public media and public broadcasting. And at Free Press, we've often defined public media uh, in terms of, of the wide array of non-commercial media in America that's really serving our communities. Part of that is PBS and NPR and our, our vital local stations. Um, another part of that is really robust and, and important community broadcasters and community media centers. Uh, every single one of the sessions, all 360 sessions that we have here, um, are being taped at the conference by volunteers from community access TV stations. Yay. So thank, thank you to them. And I, pardon me? All right, well, and related to that, um, there's a lot of community radio broadcasters who are inside of NPR and PBS and, and, both, and outside. And Maxie Jackson from the National Federation of Community Broadcasters uh, is the CEO and president of AFCB, but also uh, on the Free Press Board. And I've asked him to come here to talk about um, the wide range of community media and community broadcasting. And it's a really difficult time in many respects for community media and a really exciting time for community media. And I'm really excited to have Maxi here to talk about uh, what the future holds and where his vision for the future of community media is coming. Uh, good morning. I guess it's afternoon almost. Um, when I was first asked to be on this panel, I said, what are you going to have me do? The AV? Um, I'm really impressed with the panel, obviously. Um, I have a great deal of respect for all of them. I um, have met them at some point in time through my career, but in particular, very fond of Laura Walker, mm. President and CEO of uh, WNYC. Uh, she's my former boss. And if things don't work out where I am now, hopefully she'll take me back. But <laughs> um, I affectionately refer to her as the Great White Shark. And I do that <laughs> because uh, opportunity to her is like blood in the water. And she attacks it, and she does some amazing things at NYC. So uh, again, I'm, I'm honored to be on this, uh, this panel. Um, I want to go through and tell you a little bit about my organization, uh, NFCB, National Federation of Community Broadcasters. We've been around for about 37 years. Uh, we are the national organization for community radio. Our mission is centered around localism, diversity, and public service. We have over 175 member stations, and it's important to note that we are the embodiment of diversity in this industry. 50% uh, of our membership uh, is licensed stations to people of color, Native American, Latino, and African American, 50% of our membership. Uh, of the other 50%, about 75% of that is represented by rural stations, often sole service providers. So when you talk about the diversity, the true and robust diversity within our industry, it certainly is in the membership of the National Federation of Community Broadcasters. I should also note that we obviously are paying particular attention to the defunding uh, crisis or, or question or issue because our stations, I would uh, suggest, are the most vulnerable. Um, they are the most uh, needing of financial resources from the federal government, from CPB, and so we are very active uh, in policy uh, regarding that issue. Uh, for the most part, our mission is centered around uh, policy representation and uh, station services. Um, a lot of our policy work um, is in collaboration with the Media Democracy Coalition. I think there's some folks in here who are part of that. Um, we are also uh, supportive of universal u access and net neutrality, um, but our primary focus has been on PTFP funding, that's facility funding uh, for stations, particularly those who uh, can find matching grants to build new facilities, uh, antennas, and, and robustly outfit their, their institutions. Um, we also, of course, are very heavily involved in uh, the public broadcast funding, the 170 Million Americas campaign. And I should note that uh, NFCB was the first member organization to have its membership uh, addressed with a webinar to outline the 170 million campaign, the issues on the Hill, and uh, provide them with a, a tool kit, if you will, of resources so that they could 
do the work that is necessary to, to make the charge with our legislators. Because what I think we've learned, if anything, with all the work that we've done on the Hill over the last several years, is that it, that is not nearly as effective as the grassroots work uh, that citizens like yourself and folks back home can do with respect to reaching their legislators and demonstrating how important public broadcasting is. So that's a charge to make sure that when you do go back, um, that you galvanize the grassroots, you talk to the grass tops, if you will, and that you make sure that your legislators know how important uh, public service media is to you. Um, we do lobby, um, but I, as I said, the realization is that the greatest impact is local. When I became the uh, president and CEO of the organization just a little over a year and a half ago, um, I sort of switched the emphasis a little bit. Uh, we were very policy driven um, with some station service work. I flipped that a little bit. We are much more station service um, oriented than policy. There's two reasons for that. Number one, um, we really lack the resources to be the lead dog in that fight. Um, there are organizations, uh, Free Press in particular, that are much more robustly um, funded to do that work. But we certainly, with the growth of our membership, can provide great support uh, behind campaigns. Um, the other reason uh, is that um, I believe that if the policy is to be most effective, the policy work is to be most effective, the stations on the ground have to be optimal. They have to be really strong institutions, highly respected in their local communities. And if that doesn't happen, all the policy work really is for nothing. And so we've really focused on how we can help build more sustainable and more public service value uh, out of the stations that are in our membership. So when we talk about vision, my vision for the future of community radio includes the following transitions. Um, number one, radio stations have to transition into becoming transmedia operations. That means inherently that they've got to develop new content partnerships. We've got to look across to other media outlets and bring them in and partner with them to create new forms of content and to impact the work, the work that we all do at our stations. In addition to that, we must be conduits for the actors in a more broadly defined public media. People are questioning or are challenging the definition of public media. We embrace the notion that it should be a broader, sweeping group of folk in that, in that tent. Uh, we also embrace social media, recognizing the power it has to extend brand awareness, connectivity to community, and stimulate an exchange of ideas. And of course, digital. Uh, our stations have to become more digital. Um, that implies that you're ubiqui you, ubiquitous, that you are current, uh, and then also that you are both hyper-local and hyper-global. So I certainly endorse the notion that we have to um, embrace a more global perspective from our media outlets. Another aspect uh, of the vision that I see in terms of transition um, is that we have to, and this is going to be controversial to some folks, perhaps even in this room, transition from being public access entities to stations that embrace more of a public service mandate. Now that, I know, ruffles some folks' feathers. Um, but let me uh, unpack that a little bit. Um, before I do so, um, though, let me just say that um, two concepts really cement my idea, my vision uh, for the future of our industry, and that's interdependence and utility. So I'll break those down. With respect to interdependence, um, most important asset moving forward to me for media outlets just might be their electronic databases. Um, how well are they connected to the community that they live in? Um, and that's from individuals to organizations to funders, etc. cetera. Um, interdependence speaks to public media contributing to an ecosystem as opposed to an ego system. The classic debate between supporters of access and service uh, is just what I articulated. But I have picked up some ideas since I've been at this conference um, that allow me to, I think, feel a little bit more confidence in the stance that you can, in some respects, serve all three, uh, or both, both paths. Um, that you can have an open platform, you can complement that with something that is more curated, and then have signature programming that allows you to perhaps even generate some revenue. So there's some models out there that I think can make this less of a this or that mm -hmm. equation, but still. Um, we strongly uh, believe that stations should be looking to be part of an ecosystem in their community versus supporting the ego system that often we find in stations. Um, 
I'm going to skip down a little bit just because I don't want to abuse the time that I've been given. Um, but I'm sure there'll be some uh, Q&A that will allow us to revisit some of the topics I'm going to skip over. Um, but I do want to say our future depends on establishing and or strengthening these community relationships, manifesting them through our public service. It really is vital uh, that our stations see themselves as more than just media outlets, that they see themselves as part of an ecological system, um, that they are part of a, a, a community that is robust and that they should have a central role as a convener, um, an exhibitor, uh, etc. Um, the second word I used uh, in terms of uh, the future of this industry is utility. Uh, again, uh, this can cause trauma for some folks. Um, it brings to mind things like utilitarian, um, but I'm not going to go there. Um, I, one thing I can say, I've been in this industry for 15 years, and um, I think I have um, the ability to look across it and, and say that mainstream public media and community media share common ground but are very different uh, when it comes to content creation. There are some differences, um, fundamental differences. Um, and I hope I don't offend anyone when I say, in my mind, um, public media, uh, with some exceptions, satisfies our intellectual curiosity. It elevates our dinner table IQ. Um, it protects and preserves democracy through focus on education, journalism, mm -hmm. and expresses our humanity through the arts. I think these are all true. They're all valuable and important. I think community media has a different role, or at least I think at its best, serves in a different function. Um, at its heart, I think community media addresses our fundamental human needs. This is not a wants versus needs so much, but it's really an issue of the fact that so many community stations, again, are sole service providers. Sometimes they are preserving language and culture in a way that um, is unique uh, because of who they are and, and who they're serving. Um, when I look at the fundamental human needs, the things like subsistence, protection, affection, understanding, participation, leisure, creation, identity, and freedom, these are things you'd find if you were to deal with someone in an academic setting. But again, they protect and preserve language and culture. They give voice to the voiceless. And all of this is evidenced by the amazing work of rural and native stations in particular, um, but throughout all of community public broadcasting. This is why federal funding must not be addressed through the prism of NPR, and the stations must most endowed, uh, but through a more inclusive lens, recognizing we are a collective, interdependent, and committed to public service. There is some shared space between public and community radio, community media, but in the end, the goal is to match up with the three A's of public life as described by the Harwood Institute. They are authenticity. Are you able to authentically represent the community that you serve, that to, from your board to your staffing to your programming? Are you accountable? You've heard what they have to say. Are you listening? Are you acting on that? And third, do you have the authority? Does the community endorse you as someone who can speak on its behalf? So utility begets the notion of what I call utility media. It's described as a low-cost, high-impact approach because community stations are often under-resourced. Uh, they must recognize and utilize community resources. We must become more proficient in using journalists, experts, engaged citizens, cultural preservationists, and presenters. Utility media also represents a pathway to institutional positioning. And I think that's a fundamental aspect of the future of our industry. Um, when I say community institutions, we're talking about serving as a central convener for what the community in all its nuance has deemed most important with respect to its needs, wants, and aspirations. When we talk about cultural institutions, we're talking about promoting the preservation and forward progression of an art form and or local culture. Wrapping it up with my shameless plug to join us in San Francisco for the NFCB conference on June 1st through the 4th for more information, nfcb.org. But it's been a pleasure, uh, and again, I want to thank you for your time, your patience, and your attention. Thank you. I hate to cut any of these short because the presentations are really fantastic. We have a fantastic stack of questions over here as well, so if you're still writing questions, please do get it to one of the room monitors and, uh, and make sure it gets up here. We do have a great, great list of questions right now. 
And I'm actually going to put my questions aside um, so that we can focus some more on the questions from, me, from you all. So we'll get there uh, after our next presenter. Some of my favorite radio programs have been developed recently at WNYC during Laura Walker's tenure as president and CEO. She continues to push New York Public Radio towards new kinds of storytelling and expanding the service it provides to the over one million people, listeners in New York and around the world. And one interesting fact, actually, WNYC was actually a city-owned agency, I believe, before Laura came in and helped transition it to an independent nonprofit radio powerhouse that it is right now. And I'm really thrilled to have Laura here to talk a little bit about what the next transition for WNYC is going to be. Thank you so much. And I know you all want to uh, ask questions, so I'll try to be brief. Could you turn the lights down a little because I have a few slides. Um, you know, we're all here today because we all care passionately about independent public media. We know the value in our own lives and the value in our democracy. And as the title of this uh, session suggests, though, public media faces real challenges right now. And I believe we must rise up to them with innovation and with vision. It's a bit like a perfect storm. Um, the challenges we face come in a lot of forms. Obviously, there's political interests, there's resource limitation, and of course, a rapidly changing media landscape that requires agility, speed, and real audience engagement. It's a lot to grapple with all at once, but I think we're up to the task. Uh, Winston Churchill once said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. And I think we must be optimists or great white sharks. <laughs> um, I am not going to outline um, a few guiding pr principles. I believe that the best path forward is one where we put our best foot forward every day, where we wake up day after day committed to honest and thorough media coverage that provokes conversation and really truly engages our audiences. I want to highlight six guiding pr principles. The first is to embrace journalism. Journalism is at our core. The job is to find stories that need to be told in meaningful ways, as David said. Particularly for radio stations and for NPR, we cannot let these attacks stop us from being focused on building our journalism and really having a very, very ambitious plan, as Lee uh, spoke about, to resource our journalism and to also move it into the 21st century. That means on the local level, we need to have the audacity to massively expand our newsrooms. And at the national level and the global level, these are all so interconnected. We need to be uh, much more committed to multi-platform journalism, uh, connecting radio and online and video. And I think simply put, we need to set the standard for independent news. The second thing we need to do, I think, is to not just do journalism, but to frame and curate the story. Public media has the opportunity to convene and lead our communities and our nation in a different kind of dialogue. Hosts like uh, uh, WNYC's Brian Lehrer, like uh, the hosts here at uh, WGBH and WBUR, Madeline Brand at KPCC, they lead intelligent conversation because they know their cities, they know their neighborhoods, and they know their politicians. They engage with their community in many, many ways. And I just want to talk briefly about an event that happened in our performance space, the Jerome L. Green performance space on February 11th. We brought together, it was a live broadcast of Brian's show, and we brought together a bunch of uh, some academics, but more importantly, New Yorkers who had experienced revolution in their own country. There were Egyptian New Yorkers, there were Tunisian New Yorkers, there were Iranian New Yorkers, there were South African New Yorkers, all in one room. And um, in the middle of the show, <laughs> You're going to help me here. In the middle of the show, Brian got word that Mubarak had resigned. You sure? Yeah. Okay. All right. Anyway, it was an incredibly powerful uh, session where a woman, uh, Egyptian New Yorker, just got, off, uh, got up and said, I cannot believe this is the best day of my life. 
um, we have freedom now. And it was uh, an incredibly moving an event. And something that only, um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, that only radio can do. Another thing um, that we need to do is to tell stories. And I'm delighted, actually, that today we have a couple of our Radio Rookies here in the audience. Um, radio Rookies is a program that we have. It won a Peabody Award a few years ago. But it's a very local program. It literally puts microphones in the hands of teen New Yorkers um, and gives them the tools they need to tell their stories. Um, Alexis Gordon's dad had been in the Army Reserves her entire life. He served a tour in Iraq when she was in fifth grade and was recently deployed again to Afghanistan. Her recent story uh, on Radio Rookies uh, looked through her eyes at the impact of war on families that were left at home. Um, I just want to ask the Radio Rookies who are here to just stand and to acknowledge them. That's Farrell. Oh, <laughs> um, so, uh, and a fourth thing we need to do is to develop a new kind of relationship with our audience, whether it's through crowdsourcing, whether it is through engaging in content uh, in different ways. Um, this spring and summer, for example, we're asking all sorts of young people and other people to tell their stories about how 9-11 has impacted their lives. And we're going to then curate those and put them on the air. Um, the Takeaway recently asked our audience for haikus about the uh, economy. Uh, we went to the crowds, and this is one of the haikus that we got. Um, <laughs> another kind of, uh, I think, relationship that we need to develop uh, with our audience is um, they are our primary funders, and our listenership has gone up. We're actually reaching with all sorts of digital and, uh, uh, and broadcast. We reach 11.5 million people with our content at New York Public Radio. Um, and there are great opportunities also to, to try to figure out different ways for people to fund those. Uh, to fund us and for listeners to be uh, the, you know, to, to, to give us more money and to support the work that they care about. A fifth kind of thing that I feel very strongly about is that we have to take this opportunity to examine ourselves. We have to ask ourselves, are we doing the best we can in many different areas? Um, and look critically. Um, we need to strive for best practices. I think we absolutely need to set a goal to, to uh, have best practices in terms of governance of our journalism organizations, of our stations, governance that's independent. We need to ask ourselves, do we have appropriate firewalls? Can we push ourselves to create new models of efficiency and innovation that serve our audience best? Um, we need to reaffirm our commitment to and figure out better ways to reflect the diversity of our communities. And we need to also partner with other journalistic organizations and other people that can help us do our work best. And then lastly, I would say we need to take risks on big ideas. Uh, the final principle here is to really put innovation at the center. Our approach at New York Public Radio is has been to invest in good ideas and in research and in development. Innovation can come from many directions. It can come top down, if you will, where WGBH and, and we and the New York Times and BBC all decided we wanted to create a morning show, and PRI, of course, all decided we wanted to create a morning show that had a more conversational tone and that would serve and reflect more diverse audiences. It can come from organically, like Radiolab, Jad Abumrad and, and Robert Krolwich, um, who uh, just this week finished, uh, last week finished a great tour of uh, Seattle and Los Angeles, uh, New York and San Francisco on a live tour. They also this past uh, month had a, more than three million downloads of their podcasts and just last week won a Peabody Award. Um, that's because we, um, we really nurtured their ideas. And you'll see, you can also read in the New York Times uh, magazine section this weekend, a wonderful story about Radiolab. Uh, our big ideas also come from you know, existing things. We recently acquired WQXR in the midst of redefining what a classical music station can be. Um, and we're working with Stephen Dubner on Freakonomics Radio. Um, so I think that uh, we, we need to strive to do important work that will 
get these kind of comments from new, young, and diverse audiences. These are from focus groups about Radiolab. So I believe we must embrace the complexity of today's landscape um, and strive to cover the stories that, and issues that demand to be covered, and then dig a little deeper and report a little more. Public media must not be deterred at this point. We must be energized, um, and we must look to expand our news, add young and diverse talent, think across programming platforms, and frame, curate, and experiment. Most importantly, let's remain optimists. Let's rise to meet the challenges before us today. Let's dare to go beyond and um, to be better in spite of all these obstacles. Let's dare to be, in the truest sense, journalists. Thank you. And we'll see if we can get that video um, afterwards. I think I can figure out how to get it up. But uh, I have a good stack of questions here. Please feel free to keep them coming up uh, as we discuss. And um, I want to just jump right in. There's been a lot of questions about what happened last night with the federal budget uh, and, and whether public broadcast was still uh, on the docket, not on the docket, cut, not. Um, Paula or Laura, do you want to give a quick update? Those wireless mics should be on. Yeah. Um, right before the session, literally right before the session began, uh, I got an email from um, one of my colleagues, and they're still wading through the material. It appears that there may have been a um, very slight, and by slight I mean 1% reduction in our overall funding. What I'm not sure, Maxie, and I don't know if you have any more information, is what has happened with the PTFP program. Uh, I just came from um, Las Vegas, uh, where I was not trying to solve the future funding of public broadcasting, but I was thinking, but I was speaking to our engineers because uh, we have a meeting right in advance of the NAB conference, and um, um, uh, Bill Cooperman, who runs the um, NTIA, which is the um, organization that administers PTFP, usually comes to that meeting because it's an opportunity to explain to um, station engineers how to apply for grants, and he backed out because he said they're in the process of closing down their office. So I, I don't think that um, the prognosis of that is good. It's important because particularly in rural parts of the country where there is very complicated geography to have to deal with uh, pushing a signal out, particularly to parts of the country that, I'm giving your speech now, uh, particularly to, to parts of the country where um, the uh, public and the community stations are in fact sole service. This has huge implications, so um, I think that as we look at the overall appropriation for public broadcasting, we have to remain focused also on, on the infrastructure questions because whereas in, the, in this next year we may not see a huge impact. As we look forward, particularly as we're looking at digital technology, which has a much shorter shelf life than analog, we've got to be concerned about the overall infrastructure. That's not the stuff that people want to rush to give you contributions to support, and that's why the federal appropriation to create the network has been uh, really critical. Yeah, PTFP um, sounds wonky and technical, but my, my understanding is that there's around 70 community uh, radio stations that have applications that have been approved or have their licenses approved. They're now waiting for the funding to build those stations. So those are stations that won't be built because of this this funding cut right now. And half of them are native stations. And half of them are native stations. Yeah, that's an uh, Obama policy. Oh, I'm sorry. That's an Obama policy. It's not the right wing that did that. The PTFP cuts were in Obama's budget, um, and my understanding is that one of the interesting things is an interest of moving out of NTIA, but we can get more discussion into that in detail afterwards. Uh, there's one other question here. Is that a follow-up question? Or? That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yes, it has. So that's something that we all need as media advocates to be aware of, is that it's not always the big funds of money, it's these smaller funds that are stuck in smaller places that we don't always realize that we have to keep an eye on. Um, another question that's come up in a lot of the cards has been about uh, corporate underwriting. And one of the questions was, if we were to radically expand the budget way as you were describing, would that allow us to release some of the pressure for corporate underwriting and allow 
the public needed to be more non-commercial in that way, and, and what the impact of corporate underwriting has been in, in your eyes. Um, that, that's come up a lot in these questions. I don't know if one of the panelists want to respond to that. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> this is why she's the white shark. Um, I, I would say a, a few things about corporate underwriting. I, I, as David commented, um, programs like Frontline um, historically have been funded uh, largely through contributions of viewers like you, thank you, um, and, um, and not through corporate support. Um, I think that uh, what we have tried to do with corporate funding mm -hmm. is to look for opportunities where we can bring in resources, but recognizing that a lot of the work that we do, particularly in the area that of investigative journalism, is really um, uh, the kinds of programs that need to be funded through some combination of, of public and private support. And that's what we focus on. At, at this point, I mean, our funding is so small. And uh, sometimes I think that I'm more like Rapunzel than um, any other character because we take really such small amounts of money that we're able to leverage many times over. And if there were vastly increased amounts of, of public and private support, it would certainly change what we're able to do. But I think that um, the um, limited amount of corporate money really does enable us to expand work in, in other areas. No, no, I would agree. I, I mean, if we could get a lot more f uh, funding, I think we would want to obviously invest it in more resources and building the journalism and everything else now. Maybe that will allow us to back off a little, but I think it uh, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, never I, yeah. Maxine? Yeah, I, I also think, though, that um, it's important to have that stream of funding. Um, there are a lot of examples of small businesses in certain communities who desperately need that access point. Um, and it doesn't impinge on the content of the station. Um, I know there's some argument about that, but I, I think um, if the station is run properly, there's a firewall for that. Uh, and it, it, I, again, I think, I remember in particular when I was uh, at WEA in Baltimore, um, we did a lot of work with the Caribbean community, uh, and particularly the business community there and built out programming uh, that was vital to that community being able to understand what was going on back uh, in the islands, but also what was happening in their local community. Um, if it hadn't been for that local funding, um, we would have never been able to do that. Um, so I, I think there's a role for um, corporate sponsorship, funding, if you will, underwriting, uh, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons I would give it. So one of the, one of the questions that kept coming up over and over again um, has, was related to the decisions in the budget that happened last night. Um, in terms of what's next, what can we do, the people in the audience, uh, turning to you as, as public broadcasters, if, if these are, are the cavalry, if the people are the, you know, who want to be advocates for you, what's the best thing they can do? Maybe each of you could just give one very brief sentence. What's the, what's the best next action after NCMR? What can we do concretely? We've been halfway through the year, and so we're immediately pivoting to next year's budget, and believe me, the focus is going to continue to be on us because we are not the reason that um, the, we are not the vehicle for the federal government to solve our financial issues. The amount of money coming into public broadcasting is infinitesimally small. And so, so, and so, uh, and so that's why I'm, I'm glad to hear that Ed Markey is going to be here tonight because he's been a tremendous champion. And, um, and I think that um, Laura's right, we need to keep talking to all of the people in our communities, because as articulate and as persuasive as I would hope that some of us try to be, it is really the voice of constituents that make the difference. And um, I forget who said it, both at the grassroots and the grass tops, we've got to really press to make sure that legislators know that we care about public broadcasting and we vote. You summed it up well. That was I mean, I do remember a time when, when uh, independent producers and public broadcasting were really at odds with each other back in the, um, in the 1980s, and uh, there was a very bitter and fairly 
uh, deep uh, hostility almost between many independent producers who were going onto the hill to testify and others. I was um, at Sundance as a, as a judge in 1986, I remember, and we had this very passionate discussion about it. And I remember sort of saying that we really, all the participants, which included public television sta stations, managers, program, uh, programmers from PBS, independent producers and keys needed to get into a room together, and actually we did do it. Henry Beckton helped convene it from the side of the broadcasters and we got the independent producers together and Mark Weiss who had grabbed hold of me to say, Let's, okay, I'll, we'll take you up on this, um, and actually POV came out of it. So there, there are these, there are the, I think it's back in the local stations, where I in a, lo a local area, I think forcing that or finding the way in which that connection between community interest local uh, journalist initiatives and the public television station, which by the way, its future depends entirely on being able to open its doors and open up its facilities and finding ways to work with the community. It's that, that discussion has to happen on the local level. And uh, for, for the places that have succeeded, successfully done it, to somehow find ways to help uh, other places do it. I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's the defining uh, issue in the system if it's going to be able to survive. And David, there's a lot of questions about that. that the idea of collaborations, you mentioned a lot of collaborations in your talk, um, the idea of collaborations at the, at the very local level between local stations and local community media makers and independent producers and uh, nonprofit journals and websites, that came up over and over and over again. Um, the other thing that came up again was a lot of interest in, in uh, your question, uh, President Bollinger, about the VOA, what's the future of the VOA, and, and this question of, that has came up once or twice in the cards, should NPR and PBS be rolled into one, should it be rolled into one with the VOA, what does that look like? Lee, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? So I, I can't really speak to exactly the form this ought to take. Uh, what I really, really want to emphasize is the critical importance of creating an independent, American-sponsored free press that can report to the world about the world and report back to the United States about the world. It is, it, it is really missing the reality of where this country and the world are headed over the next several decades not to see the critical importance of American media in the world. So um, uh, I, I gave some of the, I think, telling statistics about the dependence uh, of the United States uh, on what's happening in the world. All you have to do is take China uh, and recognize uh, just how important it is to American society, just that, uh, what happens in China. And we don't know really what course uh, China will take. Highly repressive with an open economy, uh, open with an open economy, or closed with a closed economy. Those choices, those courses would have an enormous impact on, on the lives of American citizens. They are having that impact today. The amount of coverage of China, the amount of knowledge that we have about China is dangerously thin. And we count on our press, our institutional press, to help us understand that. And uh, I would think any legislator would have to th want to think about the degree to which their constituents and the American public are informed because you can't do good public policy, foreign policy, unless you have an informed public opinion. Uh, it's just not possible uh, in today's world for that. So that, I think, is the crucial thing. My personal view is that the Voice of America Radio Free Europe have served their purpose. I do not think that they can constitute that independent press identity that is so crucial uh, to confidence uh, in the world and back home. I do think PBS and NPR have uh, created that, uh, that culture uh, and that confidence, and I would build there. And uh, I would point, uh, point a note about that. The, the 
budget for international public broadcast and Voice of America and related things is actually twice of the CPB budget. Was it cut? Was it cut in the federal budget? I don't think it was um, ever in the discussion about that. <laughs> yeah, but I would just say, that, and I'm really intrigued by your bold vision here. And um, one of the, the challenges, if you will, that Voice of America has had is that it is not allowed to be broadcast here. And so there is no, with the smith munt Act, I think, uh, it basically prohibits Voice of America from being heard here. What if you basically reimagined a lot of this and looked at, because I agree with you, there are also some very good journalism within that, uh, w within the organization and, and dollars, and looked at it as a, as an independent uh, entity where things are, you know, and I agree with you also, it, it would have to be more on the NPR PBS side. You know, I, when I was coming here, I uh, got in a taxi and the, the cab driver asked me what I was doing and I told him and he said, uh, it is, I, I have my dial turned to public radio all the time. Are you, but I, but I hear you talking about, uh, you know, federal funding. Do you get money and are you really independent minded? And I said, we really are. He said, really? I said, really? He said, really? <laughs> and, I said, and I said, yes, because we wouldn't take the money if we ever felt that, the, that there was any uh, compromise there. And I think that is the key. So we are out of time, um, and I, um, I have actually two more questions here that I would love to get to. Uh, Pam, can you stay just another minute or two? And so folks, I invite you to stay if you want. We do have a little bit of buffer before the next, um, next piece of the puzzle here.